glad to see so many of you. And before we start, I'd like to take the liberty of dedicating this lecture to a dear friend of mine who passed away this past month, Ned Cabot, whom I think many of you know. Ned suffered from polio at the age of 16 uh, and did not, and, and it left him paralyzed uh, from the waist down. Nonetheless, he never let this interfere with his activity. He went on to go to Yale and then over, over which he, he overcame that obstacle and then went to Harvard Law School. Uh, he became president of Common Cause uh, and subsequently president of the New York City Chamber of Commerce and then ultimately became a professor at Trinity College before he retired here to Maine. Uh, the tragedy about Ned's disease is that, as you'll see, uh, Ned uh, had developed polio in 1954, uh, and uh, it was less than a year later that the salt vaccine became widely available. So if he had only held off a little while longer, we might have had Ned without uh, his affliction. At any rate, uh, I'd like to talk tonight uh, about uh, the relationship between Salk and Sabin and the race to find a polio vaccine. Uh, how many of you remember the Salk vaccine and got it? How many of you remember the Sabin vaccine? How many of you remember anybody in your family or among your friends who actually had polio? So uh, clearly this is a topic that is relevant today. Tony uh, went on about pathology, and uh, one of the things that's always interested me, in addition to my career, uh, was the history of medicine. And I think a lot of people think that when you talk anything about medicine in general, uh, it's sort of, well, well, we don't want to talk about that. But in fact, uh, this quotation from Fielding Garrison, who was one of the giants of the history of medicine back in the early part of the 20th century, I think is germane. Because the history of medicine is, in fact, the history of humanity itself. And if you think about the fact that doctors, before they become MDs, are people just the way all the rest of us are, with all their frailties, their foibles, their strengths and their weaknesses, you can understand why the stories of what they do uh, can be of major interest to everybody, regardless of their, of their field. Well, let's talk about polio. As you probably remember, polio used to be called infantile paralysis. It's an infectious disease caused by the polio virus. There are three different subtypes, and all three of those subtypes cause the same disease. The symptoms include fever, sore throat, vomiting, lethargy, and muscle pains. And in only about 1% of cases do people actually become paralyzed. I never knew this. Uh, I graduated medical school in 63. The polio virus vaccines became available a decade earlier. And we didn't talk a lot about polio in medical school because, after all, it was a cured disease. In two-thirds of, you know, of all the patients who are infected by the polio virus, they have no symptoms at all. So the great likelihood is that many of us had polio and never even knew it. The term was coined in 1874 by Kusmal, and Tony, you'll know who Kusmal was, Kusmal Respirations. From the Greek words polio, meaning gray, meos, marrow, and plus the suffix itis, which means inflammation. The virus multiplies in the gut. It then spreads to lymphoid tissues such as your tonsils and your lymph nodes, and in a small number of cases, it enters the nervous systems and then may cause meningitis. In about 1% of cases, the virus attacks motor nerves in the brain and in the spinal cord, resulting in paralysis. So this is a disease that is most of the time under the table. Among those who have muscle weakness, 2 to 5% of children and 15 to 30% of adults die, in large measure because the muscles, the nerves that are affected control uh, the, the breathing mechanism, and if you can't breathe, you can't die. That's the origin of the, of, the, uh, of the artificial lung, of the iron lung, to help people breathe when the muscles, uh, the muscles uh, of breathing uh, can't work because of paralysis of uh, those muscles. The spread of the virus is by fecal oral transmission, but it also may be spread by contaminated food or water. It is a disease that occurs only in humans. So you can't get it from another animal the way you can, let's say, influenza uh, or, uh, or, or other diseases. 72% of cases are asymptomatic completely. In about a quarter of the cases, there's a minor illness, fever, and a sore throat. You may have thought that you had a URI, an upper respiratory infection, but in fact, you may have had polio. 
Non-paralytic meningitis occurs in less than 5% of cases, and paralytic polio occurs in only about 1% of all patients who are ever exposed to the virus. And that's the only fact that I didn't know about myself, to be frank with you. In, among those people who do get polio, spinal polio occurs in about 80% of cases, and bulbospinal polio, which means involvement of both the nerves of the spinal cord and of the brain, in about 20% of cases, and bulbar polio, meaning polio that affects the central nervous system in only 2%. Spinal polio is the most common form of paralytic uh, poliomyelitis, and it, it results from the invasion of the motor neurons of the anterior horn cells. Uh, those are those cells uh, that you can see in gray, this H and the red dot right here. Okay. The cells in the spinal cord uh, are injured and as a result, the muscles don't work because there's no, there's no stimulus for them. As a result, the muscles atrophy because if you don't use them, they atrophy. The virus invasion causes inflammation of the nerve cells which damages them or destroys them. Uh, and, and for that reason, uh, people can't uh, move their muscles. Now, in the case of bulbar polio, uh, the nerves that are involved are in the base of the brain, in those areas that are highlighted. And symptoms include difficulty of breathing, speaking, and, and swallowing, facial and tongue weakness, pulmonary edema, that's fluid in the lungs, and shock may occur, and it usually is fatal. Now, polio goes back a long time. There are figures of people with withered limbs portrayed in ancient Egypt that are thought to have had polio. In, 18, in 1789, there was the first clinical description of the disease by Dr. Underwood. And in the 1800s, the disease began to be called infantile paralysis, which is, in fact, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the name that is used most frequently among physicians. In 1900, there were small localized epidemics that began to appear in, the, in Europe and the United States. There does not appear to be any, any clear-cut examples of polio occurring in the United States before the turn of the 19th century. There may have been cases, but they're poorly, if at all, documented. In 1950, that was the peak age of incidence, and it rose, it rose uh, in, in children between five and nine. The right of paralysis and death rose, and in 52, the worst outbreak in the US history occurred. There were 58,000 cases of paralytic polio. We have no way of knowing how many cases of real polio there were, because most people didn't have any symptoms. And there were over 3,000 deaths. Over 21,000 were left with paralysis. It was Karl Landsteiner, who was a Nobel Prize winner, who first isolated the virus. In 1908, he produced an emulsion from the spinal cord of a boy who died of polio. And after filtering the emulsion, he inserted it into the stomachs of two rhesus monkeys, who promptly came down with paralytic polio. The National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis was founded in 1938 by President Roosevelt. Uh, we now know it mostly of all as the March of Dimes. It was Eddie Cantor who coined the slogan of marching by to the dimes. It was the largest voluntary world health organization of its time, and it began funding basic research for the, for the vaccine. In 1946, the Roosevelt dime was minted expressly because of the interest in polio uh, by the, the organization, uh, and it commemorated FDR and the organization. And I don't know if any of you have thought about it, but I've been jingling uh, Roosevelt Dimes in my pocket for years, and never made the association between Roosevelt and the, and the March of Dimes, which tells you how obtuse I must be. Now, the impetus for polio research began uh, in uh, the early part of the 20th century, uh, but the incidence of polio increased over the course of the first half of the 20th century. In the 1920s and 1930s, uh, and this is paralytic polio, uh, there were approximately four cases per 100,000 people in the United States. And in the 1940s, it doubled. And then in the later 40s, it doubled yet again. And in 1950 through 54, it, it reached 25 per 100,000 and peaked in 52 with 37 uh, uh, over 100,000 people. Now, children were most frequently affected. And you can imagine what this must have done to the public at large. If you're talking about raising money for worthy organizations, what more worthy organization is there than one who would combat this kind of problem? And the March of Dimes was a master organization at PR in getting people to donate their money. Uh, all, they had posters like this all over the place, and some of you may remember these. 
What could be more beneficial than to give money to help a poor little girl like this avoid having it happen to her younger brother or sister, or for her to get appropriate therapy? As a matter of fact, of all the major health charities in 1954, if you look at the money raised versus the cases reported, you will see that the March of Dimes raised far more money than any of these other organizations, even though the number of people who were affected with paralytic polio was far less than the people who were afflicted with the other diseases. The March of Dimes raised two to three times as much money as any of the other organizations at this particular time. And among those afflicted, you can see after the, after the diagonal, 100,000 patients afflicted with paralytic polio, as opposed to 1.2 million, Heart Association, 10 million cases, the Arthritis Foundation, 11 million, Mental Health, 10 million. This is really good PR. And the important issue, I think, was that we were talking about poor little kids, your children, your grandchildren, or mine. And that was remarkable in how much money they raised. Now, one of the issues about the, uh, about the March of Dimes was that over the course of time, although they decided in the beginning that the money would go for research, in fact, more and more of the money got actually spent on taking care of patients, providing iron lungs, or providing therapy of one sort or another. And so it became a financial burden for the March of Dimes to, con to continue doing this and raising the money that it did when there were all these other organizations who were competing for funds. It was then that they began realizing that what they really needed to do was get involved in polio research. And there were a number of controversies that went on in polio research, and in fact, virology research at that time. First one was one that was one that among academics was really fiercely contested. As a matter of fact, it was as fiercely contested, contested that it reminds me of the Hatfields and the McCoys, or maybe in a more appropriate context, the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> okay. And the major issue was, do you make a vaccine ba based on using a live virus, or do you use a killed virus? And the argument was as follows. If you use a live virus, and you attenuate it, and what that means was that you domesticate it, basically, sort of like you would domesticate a, a wild animal. You continue to grow it, and grow it, and grow it, and grow it, until it loses its, its, its virulence, and you can then take this, this germ, which once were, whose great-grandparents were virulent, and give it to somebody and get an immune reaction without getting the disease, or only getting a very, very mild disease. People said that that was very dangerous because you could never guarantee when the organism might become feral again. And people could, be, could die because they were actually being given the disease, which is a no-no. The killed virus people said, well, the only way to do this and this is not just the polio virus, but it, it, it applied to bacterial infections as well for immunization. And that is, if you kill it, then it can't grow and it can't cause a disease. But those people who were live virus people said, well, if you kill it, then it loses its antigenicity. It loses its ability to invoke an immune reaction, and therefore you're not doing anything. And these guys were men, men gals because there were women who were involved in these studies too, and there's no time to talk about one very important woman in this field. These went back and forth and back and forth, and they really, you know, the, the opposing camps, you know, sort of like the War of the Roses. And of course, another question in controversy was, what about the toxicity of adjuvants? An adjuvant is a chemical that you add to the vaccination to increase its immunogenicity. It boosts the immune reaction. And many of the adjuvants that had been used were toxic. One of them was mineral oil, for example, and that's very toxic if it's injected. Another one for those who were using killed virus was, was uh, formaldehyde, which was used as, to kill the, the, the virus. And of course, formaldehyde is a very, dangerous, a, a very dangerous chemical. In those days, they didn't know that it was also a carcinogen. But in those days, we still knew that it was something bad. We used it to kill tissue and fix it in, in pathology laboratories. The other controversy was that more preliminary experiments on animals were needed. And the problem was that although, although uh, apes and monkeys uh, were wonderful hosts for the virus, they were expensive uh, and they were difficult to maintain. Uh, and it was very, very difficult to maintain a large practice of trying to do a lot of experiments on, on experimental animals. And then other people said, well, why should we waste resources on a disease that's benign in 99% of the cases? We've got all these other diseases that we're, that, that we're facing in the United States. 
Why should we spend time primarily on dealing with polio virus, even though it does affect poor little kitties? And the other issue was, after the vaccine was developed, if the vaccine is so effective, why deprive control patients of its benefit? And we'll see this later. Because what, what, what happened, whenever you do a study like this in the beginning, you want to have two populations of patients. You want to have those who get the, who get the therapy and those who don't. And those who don't are called the control patients. And if the disease is, if the vaccine is so effective, why should you deprive the people who are not getting the vaccine? Isn't that really terrible? I mean, you should be giving everybody the vaccine, not just some people. So these were some of the controversies that raged. Now, the two people who were primarily concerned in dealing with, uh, with uh, the, the research in polio were, of course, the two people you know about very well, Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin. Uh, they had much in common, in spite of the fact that they had nothing to do with one another professionally. I mean, they had sort of a mutual respectful disdain for one another, if one can put it that way. But the interesting thing is that they had very, very, very similar backgrounds. Jonas Salk was born in New York City. Uh, he grew up there, uh, and uh, because of his religion, he was Jewish. At that time, there were only a limited number of medical schools that would accept uh, Jews. And he was forced to go to, uh, to uh, uh, NYU. Uh, Sabin was born, believe it or not, in Bialystok. Mel Brooks had nothing to do with this. <laughs> but he was born in Bialystok, Poland, and came to this country when he was a very young man. And for the very same reasons, because of his Jewish background, he was restricted, and he also went to NYU. Uh, Salk eventually ended up uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, which was, a, at that time, a medical school of the second or third tier. Uh, and they were interested in founding a virology laboratory and offered this young chap the job in a, in, a, in a virology laboratory that didn't really exist, and he had to build it from scratch. He got this job largely uh, through uh, his, one of his mentors, uh, who was a, a, as you might guess, uh, a killed virus vaccine protagonist. Uh, and we'll see, we'll hear more about him later because he later became the director of the March of Dimes. Sabin uh, was a man of great intellect. Uh, while a resident, uh, he detected and figured out that there was a certain disease that was caused by a monkey virus, and he was the first person to describe this monkey virus while he was a resident, before he even had graduated uh, uh, from his training. And he went on to the University of Cincinnati, uh, which at that time was considered to be a very prestigious organization. Now, in the meantime, they knew of one another's work. They read about it in the medical literature. But as I said before, because they were on opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, the Hatfields versus the McCoys, uh, from, from a professional point of view, each one thought that the other uh, was barking up the wrong tree. Here's a picture of Salk, and here's Sabin. Uh, a sort of a vuncular looking guy, in spite of the fact that he was a real SOB, according to everybody. <laughs> when you talk about arrogance, this guy should have been a Harvard graduate. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have to go to Harvard in order to be arrogant. You'll see later about some of the things he did. Now, there had been earlier attempts to synthesize a vaccine. In 1934, Brody and Park had had a hate kill vaccine. But they used only one viral strain. And remember I told you that there were three viral strains. Uh, it, it, it was a very small study. There were no controls. Uh, and the vaccine caused polio in several cases. So here you can see that what probably happened is that the vaccine, the, the heat kill process, didn't kill all the virus. And therefore, basically, what he was doing was giving people the polio. In 35, Colmer uh, tried an attenuated vaccine it was a much larger study, but more than a dozen cases of polio ensued, and nine of them were fatal. So these weren't attenuated enough. Mm -hmm. uh, they went feral again, if I can use that analogy. Well, what were some of the obstacles to development of a polio vaccine? If you're going to develop a polio vaccine, you have to have a place to grow. You have to, have a, you have to know how many strains there are, because with a lot of infectious diseases, there are a number of different subtypes of a given virus or a given bacterium. You know about the, the, about the pneumonia vaccine, and you know it's called polyvalent. And the reason for that is that there are multiple different kinds of, of the streptococcus, and you become immune only to the one particular type that you get the vaccination for or if you get the disease. But it doesn't give you immunity for all the others. So if you're going to develop immunity, 
to any particular virus or bacterium, you have to make sure that you have immunity to all of the different subtypes of it. And so the first question was, how many strains of poliovirus are there? The second question is, how can you grow the virus in culture successfully? Because if you're going to get enough virus to, make, to, 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 to give it for a vaccine, you have to be able to grow billions and billions and billions and billions of viruses. And what we do know is that uh, the place where it had been grown in before, in monkey brain, was not a very good thing to do. Because if you took a virus that was killed, or if it was attenuated, that had been grown in monkey brain, and gave it to people, there was something in the monkey brain tissue that caused a significant degree of neurologic damage to the person who got it. They got meningitis, and they got brain inflammation, and frequently would die. So you couldn't use the virus that was grown in monkey brain the way it had been in the past. And the third question is, how do you know how to give the virus and where the virus is coming from? How does it gain access to the nervous system? Do you breathe it in and that's how you get it? Uh, we now know how it happens, but that, at that time they didn't know that. Well, in 1949, uh, a man by the name of Bodine and Johns Hopkins proposed that there were three types of polio, uh, uh, of, uh, of polio virus. But the study was small. The Warm Spring Foundation, which was, which was founded uh, in, in Georgia by FDR, funded a large multi-institutional study in 49 through 51. Sox Lab did most of the testing. And that, that research uh, uh, protocol confirmed that there were three immunologically distinct subtypes of the virus. Two of them were relatively benign, but the third one called the Mahoney strain, and we may hear a little bit more about the Mahoney strain later, was an incredibly virulent one. But now we knew at least that there were three subtypes, and if you're going to make an effective vaccine, you had to make it against all three subtypes of the virus. The next question was, how do you grow the virus in a medium that if you take the virus and then want to give it to people, it doesn't cause disease, other than you know, in addition to the polio disease itself? In 1907, Harrison developed a technique of growing isolated living cells in a tissue culture outside of the body. It was called one of the 10 most important discoveries in Western medicine, and he later won the Nobel Prize for this. You could actually grow cells in what is referred to as tissue culture, like in little flasks with all the liquid that contained all the nutrition that the cells needed. And that included human cells as well as viruses and bacteria. And in 1948, Enders from Harvard Described, discovered the polio virus will grow in cells from tissues other than the nervous tissue of monkeys. So we now had tissue that we could grow the virus in that wasn't going to be toxic to human beings. And then how did the virus get into the nervous system? Well, in 41, Sabin demonstrated large amounts of virus in the GI tract and almost none in the nasal passages of patients who died of polio in an autopsy study. Okay? Which meant that you didn't breathe in the virus, he obviously got it by ingesting it in one way or another because that's where, uh, that's where the virus concentrated itself. And it was from the gut that it later got into the central nervous system. And Bodian and Howe severed olfactory nerves of the chimpanzee and fed it in large, dose, fed in large doses of polio virus by mouth, and it died of polio. So you can see that it wasn't caused by breathing. It was caused by the virus escaping from the gut and then circulating into the body and then eventually homing in on the nervous system. Salk's preliminary human experiments began in 1952. Patients from the Watson Home for Crippled Children and the Polk School for the Retired and Feeble Minded, and he did get informed consent, and this is important because other researchers did not at the time, who already had polio, were given a vaccine of the same serotype as the virus that caused their disease. And the increase in the level of their antibodies to their virus were then measured and shown to be markedly elevated. Now what this shows was that if you give this vaccine, you can get an immune response that's effective. And that's crucial, because there's no reason to give a vaccine if you can't get an immune reaction. Now, in, re in retrospect, this should have been followed up by a, by a larger study to confirm it, but it never was. When, when this data became available, the March of Dimes then decided, well, we've got to go full steam ahead. The pressure that was building in, in, in the lay population, in the press, throughout the country, because at this time, the number of cases of polio was increasing, and what's worse than children getting polio? But the pressure on the, on the March of Dimes to do something, to, to, to push ahead with a vaccine program, was enormous. 
And the problem was that at that time, the Marcher Dines Foundation was headed by people who were not physicians. And, and they were not associated with the National Institutes of Health and were not associated with governmental uh, organizations that are responsible for the health of, of the people of the United States. So when, when they decided to pursue a trial of, of, of the salt vaccine, the objections arose, and you can bet who was one of the leading advocates of all of that objection. Saban himself, who was a wonderful rabble rouser. There was no confirmation of the preliminary study that I showed you by others. There was no published data in the medical literature. This never got published. And there was no, there was no uh, what we used to call phase one or phase two study, trying it on small numbers of people to see if, in fact, it was going to work before we jumped ahead, which is the way we do clinical trials today. The foundation should not run the study. The NIH is not involved. This is something where doctors should be involved rather than bureaucrats. And again, the, the comment that was made in several of the newspapers, the bureaucrats have hijacked the scientific process. The soft vaccine, as you know, was a killed vaccine. It's dangerous, so why rush into trials with an unfinished process when you haven't confirmed its safety? And there should be more time needed to standardize vaccine production if, in fact, vaccine production is going to be done by drug companies. So these were a number of the objections to the soft trial that were, that were voiced by a number of people uh, including Saban himself, most prominently. Uh, and of course, they're valid. But because of social pressure, uh, the Mantra Dimes Foundation went ahead with it. Oops, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. What did I do? I pushed the wrong button. Richard? Is your green light on? Oh, I, I probably turned it off. Hold on. See, That's what I said. this is what happens to this gentleman who was struggling vainly to enter the 20th century. <laughs> what are the visions on here? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My hero. So the field trials began. Uh, and uh, this was the largest medical experiment that had ever been done in American history. And mind you now, this is being conducted in large measure by people who have not, don't have much experience or any experience in devising field, clinical field trials. They finally pulled in Salk's uh, mentor uh, by the name of Jackson, who was responsible for uh, the kill virus theory, uh, uh, the, 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 the kill virus idea. And he took over with the idea that he would have carte blanche. And of course, they said, of course, you may have carte blanche, and then they took it away from it. So the study was, was defective from the very beginning. And there was a tremendous amount of confusion in deciding exactly how the study should be run. Almost 2 million elementary school children were involved. And they took students, uh, they took kids from, from the first grade through the third grade. Since nobody could figure out exactly how this trial should be run, they decided to compromise. And so they had two parallel groups. Children were randomly divided into two groups. One was those who received a vaccine versus those who received an injection of a placebo, something that was harmless. Okay? And then uh, those who were vaccinated uh, and those who received vaccine versus just being observed. So there are two populations of patients. One population is divided in two, and one group gets the vaccine, and the other gets a needle that has nothing. The other group, one group gets the vaccine, and the other doesn't get anything at all, not even a shot. Okay? And the results showed effectiveness in about 60% of cases of, 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 of against type 1. That's the Mahoney more, more really. And about 70 to 80% against types of 2. Three. And these were the data among the, among the placebo group, the, those who got, who got an injection with nothing but sterile water. Uh, among the vaccinated, there were 200, approximately 200,000 children who were vaccinated. Only 33 of them developed polio subsequently. And those who got the injection with sterile water, 115 out of approximately the same number of, of people. So there's clearly a big difference. That's a statistically significant difference between 33 and 115. The denominators are roughly the same. Of those, those children who there were 38 cases, and of the observed who were just watched, there were 330 cases. 
Uh, and you can see that even that, with the, with the difference in the denominator, the numerator is statistically significant. And when the, and when the people from the March of Dimes Foundation saw this, they were ecstatic. And they began to license drug companies to make the vaccine. And there were six drug companies in the United States that were licensed to make the vaccine. And full steam ahead, we're going to cure this disease. All these little children are going to be cured. And, and there isn't going to be any more crutches. We can throw them away. Iron lungs are the thing of the past. 1955, about 30,000 cases of paralytic polio were reported in the United States. In 56, it dropped to 15,000. In 57, it dropped to 7,000 cases. And one of the main spokespeople for the March of Dimes Foundation said, one, our main problem now is that anything that's wrong with the SARC vaccine, this, it's not that anything is wrong with the SARC vaccine, but that something is wrong with the people who won't take it. This sounds remarkably familiar now if you cross out the word SARC and just talk about vaccines. In 1961, the last year the SARC vaccine exclusively was used in the United States, there were fewer than 1,000 cases of polio in the entire country. Well, Sock was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 1955. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 77. Saban huffed and puffed and said, Sock made no basic scientific discovery. You could go into the kitchen and do what he did. <laughs> well, there was a lot of fallout from the Salk trial. And some of you may remember some of it because it really was a real big color There was pressure placed on the six drug companies licensed to make the vaccine to increase production. I'd imagine. Pressure was placed on the foundation by the public to increase the number of immunizations, and internal pressure was placed on the foundation to increase vaccination for financial reasons because they were spending all these dollars on treatment. Uh, in 1954, the last year where a lot of treatment had to be done, the uh, foundation was spending three quarters of its, of, of, its, of its funds on taking care of patients who were sick rather than funding research. And so there was a tremendous amount of pressure, not only in the public and in the press in general, but also within the organization itself to do something and get everybody vaccinated. Well, you might have expected Murphy was in the wings. <laughs> Shortly after the widespread soft vaccination was undertaken, vaccinated groups of children began developing polio. And unusually, the paralysis occurred in the arm in which the vaccination had been given. The vast majority of people who get paralytic polio get it in the lower extremities if they don't get bulbar polio. But this was occurring in one arm only, and it was in the vaccinated arm. Bells ringing. Research showed that all the cases that had received the vaccine, it was manufactured by Cutter Laboratories from California. Somebody may remember Cutter's labs, but they're now, they've now been merged into a larger company. Cutter Labs had a federal license to make the vaccine. There were 400,000 doses that had already been given and another 400,000 that had been distributed, ready to be given. Dr. Scheel, who was the Surgeon General, asked advice from four experts in the field of virology. They refused to make a formal recommendation. So Scheel sent experts to Cutter to evaluate the methods of manufacture, and he ordered a halt to all immunizations pending the review of all six manufacturers' methods. This did not sit well for the Marjorie Dunn's Foundation. There was a political upheaval, as you can imagine. The press went haywire with all of this. The Democrats, who were not in power, this is during, the, this is during uh, Eisenhower's administration, went crazy. And they demanded the firing of Rita Kalpati, who was the secretary of HEW. They needed, they needed a scapegoat. And because the HEW and the government had not been more demanding in being involved in the study and, and, and getting and, and cutting off the foundation and, and, and telling them that they had to do it by more scientific methods, uh, she had to go. I admitted when he was interviewed there was a bit of a shortcut in the process of making the virus, but that's about as far as he went. The pro-life vaccine experts say, I told you so, you shouldn't have used the virulent Mahoney strain in making this, and you, you might have guessed who said that. The Sheila panel found a unique haste in bringing the vaccine to market. They believed that it was not adequately tested in prior controlled study before widespread distribution. The, I mean, of course, that's the answer. In May of 1955, Park, Davis, and Lilly, two of the six manufacturers, were cleared uh, for production of the vaccine, but it was too late for their use of the vaccines during the polio season that year. On the 23rd of May, Sheila appointed a committee to review the data to decide if immunization should be restarted. The committee voted eight to three in favor of starting it, but there was a huge amount of contention. 
And as you might imagine, there was a minority, a, a minority of, 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 of a minority opinion written much like the Supreme Court today. <laughs> the panel found that Cutter's problem was finally, they finally decided that it was due to clumping of the virus particles in the killing process. Remember we talked about this was a, this was a killed vaccine. And what Cutter was using was formaldehyde. And what they would do is that they would perm, they would take the, the, the vaccine, that they, the, the, the viruses that they had made, uh, which were alive, and they would pass them through a system where they would be exposed to formaldehyde at just the right concentration to kill them, but without enough concentration to end up in the, in the vaccine itself. But the problem was that because they were trying to do this so quickly, they didn't adequately aerate and stir the mixture. And as a result, some of the virus particles clumped together and some of them in the middle of the clumps didn't get exposed to the formaldehyde, and therefore they didn't get killed. And that was the reason. Further fallout occurred, there were professional attacks against Salk. Uh, they increased. Ovina Kalpabi resigned. Heads rolled at the HEW and NIH because they hadn't been more aggressive in trying to stop it. a premature study. And the budgets of the PHS and NIH were reviewed. Why was there so much money and energy spent on a rare disease? That was a lot of people saying that we made a big mistake, we've caused more trouble than anything else. And one of the lines that appeared in one of the papers, I think it was the New York Times, that the, that the foundation was first in funds but least among victims. The criticism of the Polio Foundation was, was, was crucial, particularly by the medical, medical fraternity in general. It was called a private organization with no oversight by the government or by the medical community at all. The AMA had a formal critique, critique that the medical establishment was not adequately involved in the process. As a matter of fact, the AMA came out saying that the, that the virus should only be given in doctor's offices by physicians and not by trained other healthcare personnel. There were lawsuits against Cutter, as you might have imagined, and Saban quoted. <laughs> well, now Saban had his turn. Okay, we've now got a virus, we've now got a, a, a uh, we've now got a, vaccine against virus, uh, against the virus, which may be helpful, but which there are problems with, and we need to solve those problems. Well, Saban said, I have come to the conclusion that a polio virus which does not produce paralysis after direct spinal injection in chimpanzees, which he had been doing, may be regarded as safe for orienting studies in human beings. And he submitted this to New York authorities saying, I would like to take mentally defective children who are under constant observation and offer the best opportunity for careful follow-up to study, and he was turned down by the Bio Research Committee, as you might examine, as you might imagine, because there's no way to get uh, parental consent in these cases like this. Well, he had a plan B. He then turned to uh, federal healthy male inmates in the federal prison in Chillicothe, Ohio, who had no antibodies to polio before the trial; they'd never been exposed to polio, and he gave them his vaccine. And in all cases, the inmates developed a significant amount of antibodies to all three strains of the virus. If you've never had exposure to the virus before, you won't have antibodies to it. But if you give them the vaccine, they should develop antibodies to it, and in fact, they did. He went to the National Foundation and said, look at this, this is great, how about if you, if you fund me? And they turned him down for a mass trial. Well, you'll never guess where Saban went next. <laughs> now, if, you, if you're old enough to remember the Cold War, you remember that uh, at the end of 1953, when Stalin died and Khrushchev took over, there was a bit of a thaw, not much, but a bit of a thaw uh, between Russia and the United States. And after 1953, that's when some of these cultural and scientific exchanges began to occur. And so Russian scientists in 1956 visited Sabin's lab to study polio. Saban got an invitation to visit Russia, where polio incidence was increasing dramatically, and he gave lectures and seminars. The Russians uh, invited both Salk and Saban to come to Russia. Salk refused. Saban accepted. Russia began a large-scale testing uh, program and chose the Saban vaccine. So the Saban vaccine was never tested in the United States. In 19, and, and this gives you an idea about the Russians, you know, full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes, no control studies, no pre-existing uh, small studies. 
1959, 10 million children were vaccinated with the same trivalent vaccine vaccine given to them in candy or an eyedropper. There were no controls, no placebos, and no children were denied the vaccine. 77 million were ultimately vaccinated. It was a great success, according to the Russians and according to Sabin himself. Sabin said, Russia will be the first country in which eradication of polio will be achieved. Well, <laughs> why well, trust the Russians? I mean, we couldn't trust them with anything else. And there are a lot of people in the medical community who didn't trust Sabin either. So a close colleague of Sabin's, who at Sabin's urging, convinced the World Health Organization to send a scientist to evaluate the Russian results. At Sabin's urging, Dorothy Horseman, who was an ally of his, was chosen. And during her evaluation in Russia, he was secretly communicating with her all the time. You'll see Horseman's evaluation in a minute, but WHO was pressured by Sabin allies to choose the oral vaccine over the salt vaccine. Horseman's report concluded Everything seems in order. The standard of lab work is high and facilities are adequate. Although final results will be slow in coming, it is apparent that the Sabin strains are safe and effective. The mock production of cases in 59 in the orally vaccinated Russian Republic suggests that the vaccine may have played a significant role in reducing the incidence of poliomyelitis. Well, I guess that says it. Sabin triumphs. In August of 60, the Surgeon General Roy Burney approves the Sabin vaccine for trial manufacture in the United States. In 61, the AMA accepts its council's recommendation to replace the Salk vaccine with the Sabin vaccine as soon as supplies are available. The council chair of this sought advice from Sabin and Sabin allies only. He never consulted Salk or any of Salk's allies. Salk's objections to the AMA and the government were stifled. AGW subsequently licenses Sabin's three strains of his vaccine, supplanting the salt vaccine. And the salt vaccine was given by itself only in 1961 for the last time. Well, Salk did get revenge of a sort. He died, Sabin dies in 93. And his obituary, obituary in the New York Times says, throughout his long career, he was noted for diligence, hard work, and long hours, as well as brilliance in research. Salk dies two years later, and his obituaries, which were all over the country, called him a savior, a godsend, a humanitarian, a benefactor to mankind. Scant could have did him when he was 60 under. Time magazine wrote, one good way to assess the great figures in medicine is to see how completely they make us forget what we owe them, and by that measure, Dr. Salk ranks very high. In an editorial at the time, at the, at the time of Salk's death, someone quoted, Salk was the hero, but in many ways, Sabin was the victor. The irony is that despite their monumental contributions to medicine, neither Salk nor Sabin ever won the Nobel Prize in medicine. Salk was nominated, but he didn't get, he was one of the nominees, but he didn't get it. And Sabin was never even nominated. Well, let's fast forward to 2006, and this is another last example of Sabin's triumph over Salk. In 2006, the U.S. Postal Service issued a series of stamps commemorating famous Americans. And among those were two portraits of Salk and Sabin in his Americans, famous American series. Here's the stamp with Salk, a 63 cent stamp. Here's the one with Sabin, an 87 cent stamp. So despite the fact that there are, maybe because of the fact that there are, that there had his jealousies were so, were so petty, in fact. Salk can say that he got the higher face value on the stand. <laughs> what about the eradication of polio? What's happened since then? Following the widespread use of the vaccines, the incidence of polio has dropped dramatically. In 1988, the WHO and UNICEF launched a global eradication effort. The result was a drop in reported cases worldwide from 350,000 in 1988 to 483 cases in 2001. In 2016, there were 42 cases reported worldwide. At present, the only cases reported worldwide now are in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. And you all know about the stories, I think, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's because uh, there are two reasons. The first is that the Pashtun believe that we're trying to sterilize them. 
And the second reason is that it was polio workers, uh, well, it was, the, it was the CIA disguised as polio workers in that area who were the individuals who would determine where Osama bin Laden was located. And, 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 and the people in that area remember that, and so they think that the people who are coming to try to give polio vaccines are in fact, are in fact uh, the CIA. A persistent problem with polio is the rare occurrence of vaccine-caused polio, and because of this, the CDC in the United States has now recommended the use of both salt and Saban vaccines in mixed vaccination. So at least they've made peace in the United States. <laughs> However, the regimen is used only in the United States and throughout the rest of the world Saban has triumphed. Maybe it's because it's easier to suck on a piece, of, a piece of sugar than it is to take an injection. At any rate, that's the story. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And if there are any questions, I'll take them out. Yes, but in nature it didn't exist in Japan. Could you turn the lights up? Only when it was injected on an artificial in the laboratory. Turn it on. Turn them on so I can see. Why was there such an uptick in cases in the early 50s? Do you think? One could make the argument that uh, it was a period of time after the war uh, with increasing prosperity. There were more people taking vacations. Uh, I can remember being told uh, when I was a kid, don't go into swimming pools, don't swim in fresh water. Okay, well, uh, I think my guess is, and I don't know any specific data to prove this, that this was at a time when more people were, being ex were going to places where they would be exposed to where the virus was, uh, as opposed to beforehand when you didn't go swimming in the ocean that much, and of course the war, there was a big story. Yes? What is the March of Dimes doing now? I don't think it exists any longer. Oh, yes, oh, yes. It, does. it does? Well, there's the news for me. What does it do? Prenatal care. Prenatal care. Yeah, I mean, when, when the vaccine came, bingo, they went to you know, the cause, you know, cause of it. Yes. Uh, no. I, I'm surprised of the, of the number of people who had it and were asymptomatic. Yeah. yeah. Did they receive any immunity to polio having had it? I don't know how one would measure that. If you don't know if you've ever had polio, how would you know whether to measure the, the antibody response? Well, Presumably you would, but I don't think there are any studies that I've ever seen that have, said, that have documented it. And uh, would, would people, uh, our, say our age group, who lived through that epidemic uh, in the 50s, uh, would we be susceptible to polio now if we did not receive the vaccine in the 50s? Well, the question is how you're going to be exposed to it if it's virtually eliminated. I mean, the nice thing about this, we can talk about this at another time, herd immunity. Yeah. If everybody is immune to it or there's no, and, and, and it, isn't, it isn't widespread in the community, then the likelihood of you getting it is minuscule. I would suggest that if you go to the Pashtun areas of, of Afghanistan or, uh, or Pakistan, if you're looking forward to getting the disease, that's the best place to go. <laughs> or Nigeria for that matter, uh, but uh, there's no real way of knowing. I'm sure we all have antibodies. I mean, I don't know of any tests that have, I mean, there are some, there are some vaccines that deteriorate over, you know, the, the immunity deteriorates over time. You know, tetanus is a good example. Uh, but uh, there are others where you have lifetime immunity. And I'm not sure that anybody wants to make the test. It's a question of it, yes. I was wondering when the saving um, vaccination first started. I remember getting both. I remember getting the soft vaccine first. Yeah. Unless I got a placebo, because I would have been about in that first grade. Um, and then I remember getting the same vaccine after that. Yeah. Um, and it seemed to me the only difference was that you know you could avoid the shot by getting the same vaccine. You got it. But I can't remember that the difference in the years. Well, I don't know when you got the salt, and I don't know when you got the Sabin, but the last time in the United States that the salt vaccine was given by itself was 1961. No, I got it around 55 or... Then you got the salt vaccine because the Sabin wasn't available then. Right. And, and you subsequently got the Sabin vaccine. I think many of us did. I got both. Yeah. How, how long after did they introduce the Sabin vaccine for everybody? 
The Salem vaccine became the only uh, the only vaccine used in the United States in 1961. But did they did they follow the, the sock vaccine with Salem as soon as it was available in case people weren't fully? Not until much later, and now now they advise both because of the business. post-vaccination polio. Yes? Uh, yeah, in our country we're getting both now, but um, I know the uh, Gates Foundation has made a big push against polio. And, and for the, uh, is it the salmon or the sock that they use in Africa? And the sock. Oh. Okay. Another question, yes. In 1961, as a sophomore at Berkeley, I was given a sugar cube. You were? Yeah, I was. And I was a sugar cube. I never no. was what? 19? We don't have to know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, when my mother was pregnant in 1955, they ran out of the vaccine, and then she got polio, both bulbar and spinal, in September. And I just. Uh, was there a shortage in 55? I mean, they stopped production and stopped giving the vaccine until they cleared up the problem with Cutter Laboratories. Uh -huh. so and so there was a hiatus in 55 uh -huh. where people did not get the vaccine. Uh -huh. Yes? You showed, you showed data on the results of the SALT trials, but is there data from the Sabin trials in Russia showing what the occurrence is, other than we've eradicated it completely, which was... I was, I was unable to see it. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they may have been, but I, I was unable to find any. Yeah. Yes, Kevin. I, I thought that the Russian vaccine was the best vaccine in our generation. Yeah. <laughs> Influenza virus. Uh, yeah, like same idea, same same principle. Yeah, yeah. Michael, you had a question. Well, I was just making a point. 
you, you mentioned President Roosevelt. Uh, he had polio, didn't he? Yes. That was his thing. So that was the, I they never connected the March of Dimes with the dime and President Roosevelt's polio. And very interesting. Aren't you glad you came? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes, here. There's um, people who haven't asked questions before. I know a couple of people who have who say that they have post polio syndrome. Yeah. And I wondered if that's being studied or if there's any knowledge about why that interesting question. People. Interesting question. Uh, uh, Tony told you that my ego preceded me in this room. And just to <laughs> prove him right, uh, I'm going to tell you that if you're interested in more about polio, are interested in other diseases like this is someone that I know intimately. I see him in the mirror every morning. Uh, who's going to be teaching a course this fall about ten germs that uh, that shook the world, and we're going to talk about post polio syndrome when we talk about polio in much greater detail than we talked about it now. Yeah, post polio syndrome is a real is a real phenomenon, and uh, the it's being studied. To the best of my knowledge, people now believe that what happens is that because all the muscles have atrophied uh, and they're not getting constant exercise uh, the way they should, that over a period of time, as one ages, what happens is that those muscle fibers that are left are overworked and they're stressed and they can't function properly. And so what happens is that you get a decrease in the function of those muscles that are not properly enervated by the nerve which has been damaged or dead. And as a result, you get further damage to the muscle. It's sort of like overexerting yourself. And I'm sure that the aging process contributes to that because there's a natural phenomenon of atrophy of most all of our organs uh, with varying time sequences as we age. I would imagine that there aren't a whole lot of physicians that know a whole lot about polio right now. That's true. Certainly younger That's physicians true. because well, they've never seen it. I asked Tony beforehand about a whole lot of this. Uh, when I graduated in 63, polio had in large measure been eradicated. We were now using both the SOC and the Sabin vaccine. Uh, and uh, I never saw a case of polio. I, I did see one case of polio, uh, not as a new patient, but as somebody who was in an iron lung uh, when, when I was doing my internship. Uh, but uh, the generation before, the physicians, particularly pediatricians, would know all about polio and how to diagnose it because it was a common disease. Uh, but that's what happens. I mean, how many people here, well, I shouldn't say this because you're not physicians, but how many physicians in the United States today know very much about schistosomiasis, for example, which affects hundreds of thousands of people annually, millions of people in the United States? And the answer is very few because we don't see the disease in the United States. So why should we know about a disease we don't see? Yes, Mark. Just a question, because I never knew anyone personally, but when folks who had polio and didn't die in the 50s and early 60s, did they eventually get better, or what happened to them? Uh, it depends upon the severity of the, of the, uh, of the compromise. Uh, many, what you'll see today is, uh, and we have a friend who lives out on the West Coast who had polio, and she's perfectly capable of moving around properly, but one of her legs is much, much thinner than the other because the muscles in that leg uh, didn't get appropriate in innervation from the nerves. And so she has one leg, one lower leg, that's much, much smaller than the other. Uh, so a lot, uh, there is an improvement phenomenon, but it's variable uh, from case to case. And it would depend upon the severity of the damage of the nerves. Esther. At the risk of asking you to repeat the whole answer, somehow or other, you want me to? No. <laughs> Somehow or other, Tomorrow. I might get the difference between the salt vaccine and the saline vaccine. Okay. Two differences. Oh, the first, the, the most important one is that the salt vaccine is made by killing the virus. Okay. And the saline vaccine is made by domesticating it. Put in a, it's called attenuation. You continue to grow the virus over and over and over again until eventually it loses its virulence. Sort of like defanging the tiger. Say the vaccine is given by mouth. Yes. This is partly a comment, but I think that your friend sort of demonstrated this that polio personality, that perseverance, that my mother, you know, had bulbar and spinal. She had affected one of her upper extremities as well as both legs. 
And she went on to be a real activist in her community. I mean, she she did things that some of her peers weren't even involved in. And I, I've seen that throughout time of other people who had polio. Well, uh, just not to prolong this because I know how yeah. you have to get home at um, bedtime. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, friend, my friend Ned uh, told me uh, early in the course of our friendship that he decided after he recovered that his polio was either going to be a handicap or a challenge. And he decided to make it a challenge. And he succeeded. Yeah. One last question. How many more questions are we in time to answer? Your call. My call. Well, you're all free to go whenever you want. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask you your scientific comment on what's happening, what's been happening in the last five years in America with um, there's the movement of uh, parents refusing to have their children vaccinated for measles. And if you've done, if you've had any um, research or heard anything as to, you know, first of all, the measles virus is something that just exists in, our, in everybody's body. Is that correct? I'm sorry, say again. The measles virus is just something that exists in everybody's body and you have to have, be vaccinated. No, no, no. Ah. You pick up you pick up viruses and bacteria from from very outside sources. Uh, we were not born with measles virus in us. We, some many of us end up with other viruses in us, uh, like herpes virus, for example. Uh, but uh, no. Um, and and the whole issue about the controversy about vaccination would require another lecture. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, we don't need to go into that. I mean, it's a fascinating story, but. Yeah. Uh, it's got lots of ramifications. It's a very interesting comment, though. I'm You're all free to go, then. <laughs>